just wanted to welcome everyone to the session. Um, we're just waiting for everyone to join. So give us one minute as people start joining. But for the moment, just wanted to say welcome. This is going to be an interactive session. And we really hope that you're going to be learning some skills that you can take away from the session. So we're going to be, first of all, looking at what resilience means to us. Um, what is resilience? What is climate resilience? How do we measure resilience? How do we measure our own resilience? How do we develop a resilience action plan for ourselves that we can also use to help others as well? Um, and then we're going to be doing something quite interesting. We're going to be developing our own resilience dashboards, showing the different risks across different countries that each of you is going to be helping us create in the session. So hopefully it'll be very interactive and hopefully you will enjoy it. Um, so I'm just going to um, introduce uh, my co-facilitator. So we've got Ken. Um, Ken, would you uh, mind um, and, um, just unmuting and, and showing your, yourself on camera? And I'm hoping we also have Sheen um, who will also co-facilitate. Co so introducing two co-facilitators. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Florida. My name is Ken Rama. Uh, I am um, with VSO. I am based in Nairobi in Kenya, and I'll be co-facilitating this session uh, with Claudia and of course the support of Shin. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a very interactive and um, session full of learning. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Sheen. I'm from the Philippines. I also work with uh, VSO, and we have a, a program here, uh, the Safe, Peaceful, and Resilient Communities, which is being implemented in the Bangsamoro uh, areas mostly. So I'm happy uh, to join you in this uh, conference. So sorry again, you are muted. Thank you, both of you, Sheen and Ken. And yeah, um, so let's get started. And, and just to, maybe just to say that this session really depends on you. So your ideas, your energy, um, your participation is going to really enhance the session. So really looking forward to hearing from your experience because you're the key people that are part of this session. Um, but first of all, let's reflect on what resilience is. What does resilience mean? Um, and I'd like all of you just to close your eyes for 30 seconds and think about resilience. What image comes to your mind? What image comes to your mind when you think about resilience? Do you get a picture? Do you see an object, an animal? Do you see something else? And if you can write on the chat panel, um, what image or what thing comes to your mind when you hear the word resilience? And Sheen, I'm wondering if it's possible for you to start sharing our Jamboard screen as everyone thinks about their resilience symbol. Okay, so we're starting to get some reflection. So one person says resilience is about withstanding challenges. Excellent. Anybody else? So if anyone else had an image in their mind of resilience, you can unmute and tell me what that image is. You can see on the screen here, we've got a flower growing in an arid environment. So that's, that flower is obviously very resilient. Do you have another image you'd like to share with the group? Okay, thank you, Adele. And um, um, we've got some statements there of what resilience is um, and also a statement from, um, so we've got um, an image from um, Malherp saying it's livestock farmers continuing farming during droughts, exactly. Um, and Sophie, resilience is bouncing back, amazing. Um, and then um, I am absorbing and adapting shock to shocks. Um, so some great um, 
some great statements there. And I think even in those statements, you're starting to capture the true essence of what resilience is. Does anyone else have an image or a statement that they would like to unmute and share? Um, if you do, please raise your hand um, and we can, or just unmute and share what your image of resilience is. What's your symbol of resilience? So let's just go into what resilience is. So for VSO, um, resilience is exactly as you shared, it's the ability to absorb or withstand a shock or stress. It can be any type of shock or stress, but for climate resilience, we're obviously looking at climate shocks and stresses. Um, so things like floods and droughts, typhoons, heat waves are all examples of shocks and stresses that we're seeing already that we need to address. Um, so it's our ability um, or the ability of communities that we are working in um, or the ability of the systems, the schools, the health centers that people depend on to absorb those shocks and stresses, to withstand them and also to recover quickly from those shocks and stresses without compromising future sustainability. So we can all recover, but if we're recovering in a way that was using all our energy for the future, then we're not resilient. So it's about not, about, resilience is about being sustainable as well. Um, and for VSO, and um, I'm not sure if Sheen can share, um, but and for VSO, we, um, what we see resilience building as is, is a process. Anybody can build resilience. Anybody can build their own resilience and anybody can help others to build resilience of a school, of a health center, of a community. Um, but there are some key steps that are the most important part of building resilience, some simple steps that we can all take. And we'll be taking those steps in this Skillshare session. So the first step is identifying what is the stress or shock we want to res build resilience to. So our resilience to different shocks and stresses are different. So we need to focus on the stress that we want to build resilience to. The second step is identifying what makes us vulnerable or what makes our community vulnerable to that stress. And we'll be teaching you and sharing with you how to do that. Um, and the third step is about identifying the actions and the interventions are needed to address that vulnerability and to build resilience. And then fourth, resilience is all about partnership. We can't do it on our own. So identifying the resources, the skills and partners that we need to work together to build resilience. So even your own personal resilience is dependent on other people. So what partners will help you build your resilience? So those are the simple steps of building resilience. And these steps are exactly what we're gonna take for the rest of our Skillshare session. So I'm gonna hand over um, to my colleague, Ken, shortly. Um, he'll be sharing those resilience building steps with a very simple tool called batteries. We'll be sharing how you can build resilience using batteries. Uh, but before that, I do that, just on the vulnerabilities and capacities, we've already identified we need to understand the shock, but we also need to understand the vulnerabilities and capacities um, to address that shock. So I'll just maybe quickly introduce five different types of resilience, five different types of um, vulnerabilities and capacities. Um, I'm Shane, would you mind sharing the screen um, that shows the five different asset types? Yeah, perfect. The, yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, so we identify the first step for building resilience is to identify the shock or stress. Um, so we're going to be thinking about what shock or stress that we are facing. Um, once we know the shock or stress, we can start thinking about what is our personal resilience to that shock or stress. And that will be dependent on five different types of assets, five different types of resilience. So the first type of resilience is a resilience inside of you. This is your human resilience. And this is a resilience that is related to the information that you have and the skills that you have, um, and also maybe your health or your mental health that will be, that's all inside of you that you need to draw on to be resilient. The second type of resilience um, is about the social resilience. So this is the interaction between you and other people and um, your partnerships, your relationship with your family, your community and services you can access. So social resilience is a resilience that's between people um, and between people and the systems that they depend on. 
And the third type of resilience is economic resilience. So this is our finance, our savings, our livelihoods that we rely on to, to be resilient to shocks and stresses. Um, and then we also have physical resilience and environmental resilience. So this is a resilience that surrounds us, that we draw from our surroundings. Physical it might be infrastructure, roads, buildings, even mobile phones and communication systems that we depend on to be resilient. Um, but environmental resilience is really important. That's the natural resources and the, the, the natural environment that's really important for our resilience. So as we go into the next session, we're going to be thinking about all those five types of resilience um, and how if we're missing some of those, we might be vulnerable and how if we have those, we are very capacitated, we have resilience. Um, and the next step is looking at how we can actually develop a resilience action plan using the batteries tool. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Ken, who will share with you a little bit about the work he's been doing in Kenya and Ethiopia to build resilience in these five different ways using the batteries tool. Over to you, Ken. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia, for that um, elaborate explanation of the types of um, vulnerabilities and um, even capacities that we have in, in, our, uh, in our quest to build resilience. So uh, for me, I will um, share with you how to build resilience uh, using uh, one of the but, uh, tools that we've been using, it's the batteries tool. And we have other kinds of tools that we use uh, to build uh, you know, resilience. And this will help us, uh, you know, they've helped us in um, uh, understanding various vulnerabilities, assessing various vulnerabilities and capacities and even opportunities that are there in building resilience. So uh, for the batteries tool, um, uh, what I would ask if you can is um, you could have a pen or pencil and a paper uh, for you to be able to, um, you know, uh, move along smoothly with us uh, uh, for the session. Um, so at some point we'll ask you to draw uh, your own battery. Um, and so that will help as you move along. So please, if you can get a pen and a paper uh, to help us, um, you know, move along together. So um, the, we have five batteries, as you can uh, see on the screen, and um, uh, each battery represents an asset, as Claude has mentioned. So we have the human uh, battery, social, uh, physical, uh, natural is also environmental, and uh, financial, which is also economic. Uh, so the first step um, is to identify uh, the various vulnerabilities. Uh, so, so I mean, uh, you. Uh, the first step is to identify that particular uh, stress or shock that your community is experiencing. Um, so, once you identify that, then you'll be using the uh, battery tool to establish the vulnerabilities. And then, um, as you know, as, as um, the third step, you'll be using uh, that information that you have collected to uh, identify how to reduce those particular vulnerabilities and even develop um, you know, action plans with that regard. And especially um, looking at resources and stakeholders that need to be involved in the entire process. Uh, so uh, to make us understand, I, will, uh, I want us to use an example. Um, so what you see on the screen is um, an example of um, you know, battery tool that was used uh, before, uh, you know, in a practical setup where uh, they looked at the human, social, physical, uh, environmental, and economic uh, pillars or aspects of uh, building resilience. And, uh, you know, this is to help establish uh, the various uh, stress and shocks. Um, uh, Shin, if you can uh, move uh, to the next. Um, I would want us to um, draw, if you can, on your pen, uh, you know, on, on your piece of paper, if you have a pen or pencil, you can have um, this drawn uh, just so that I can explain um, using, um, you know, an example of how to use the resilience batteries. So uh, what you need to know with the battery tool is that um, when your battery is fully charged, 
or is uh, you know the bars are full then that means it has a lot of power it, it can uh, sustain you and can be able to do a lot of things with it it's just like a simple battery um, and when your bars are almost empty or empty then that means you do not have a lot of power you do not have um, a lot of um, you know capacity to be able to sustain yourself so that is the concept that you bring on board uh, on the uh, battery stool in building resilience that once you establish your vulnerabilities and capacities if you have a full battery then that means you are resilient on that pillar um, so if your human um, uh, battery is full then that means you are resilient if your uh, social battery is almost empty or halfway then that means you are uh, you know just about uh, you know on the balance and so um, I would want us to just uh, you know as you draw as you uh, uh, get to put your battery stool to, uh, you know on the paper together uh, I can go through one example of how you um, uh, you know can use a battery stool so in my community uh, drought is an issue so that is the stress or shock uh, so using uh, drought as uh, the main uh, priority uh, you know concern in my community will have it as the stress or shock so on the human side or on the human pillar uh, this is something that is within ourselves so what is making us uh, vulnerable or um, resilient in terms of dealing with uh, drought so it could be um, uh, we do not have enough information so information or knowledge on how to adapt to uh, you know uh, drought uh, we do not have information on um, climate smart agriculture so that becomes a vulnerability um, if you look at uh, the social side this is how we relate with other people if you do not have any support group uh, you do not have any um, you know good relations with the local authority you do not have good relations with your neighbor in in the event of a drought you are not able to go to your neighbor to ask for food uh, you are not able to support yourself so that becomes a vulnerability i'm just giving brief examples um, on the natural or um, environmental aspect uh, the season uh, the rivers nearby are seasonal and so they barely have um, you know water in them uh, during most times of the year so that becomes a vulnerability if uh, there isn't enough tree cover, so that means there's vast um, open lands that have not recovered, and that becomes a vulnerability. Uh, on the economic side, these are how um, uh, livelihoods are able to sustain themselves. So if you do not have economic activity or you do not have employment, then that becomes um, a vulnerability because you will not be able to um, afford how to, you know, uh, Feed your family in the event of a drought you are not able to buy food so that becomes a vulnerability uh, physical is um, things to do with infrastructure so if you're in a very uh, remote area where there isn't um, you know good network of roads uh, there isn't good connectivity um, the uh, you know the nearest hospital is maybe 10 kilometers away then that becomes um, a vulnerability so once you've identified those vulnerabilities based on those uh, five pillars uh, what you need to uh, consider is uh, the capacities also that you have so in terms of capacity and uh, what are your coping mechanisms as at now that despite uh, the drought what are you doing to survive uh, they tend to be a, a mix-up or confusion uh, between um, the capacities and and the actions that you need to take so the capacities are what you're doing as at that time, as at now, in the midst of that uh, stress or shock, the drought, what are you doing to survive? Um, whereas uh, for the action planning, as we we'll, uh, look in a bit, is what opportunities are there? What can you potentially do to uh, address the gap in that, um, um, you know, uh, for that stress or shock? So again, I'll just uh, go over briefly. Uh, using uh, you know to assess the capacities um, and so using drought as the same stre uh, stress or shock again um, you know as, a, as the main issue depending on what that will be so in this case that is a stress so using um, drought on the human side or you know on the human pillar you can say that um, you are in good health you have uh, uh, physical strength and physical abilities so that means you're able to 
um, move around. Uh, you can be able to look for food in the midst of drought. You can be able to even move from one place to the other um, to get food. So that that is um, a human um, capacity. That is what you're doing at this time. You also have information about uh, where uh, the government delivers uh, food aid. So that means every uh, day of the week or every a couple of days, you know where to go to to get aid in terms of uh, food uh, supply from the government or from you know um, humanitarian authorities. Uh, so that becomes a human asset. Um, on the social side, uh, social pillar, you're looking at how you relate with other people. So if you are in a support group, uh, then that means um, whenever there is doubt, you're able to support one another. You're able to uh, pull resources together and support uh, one another. So that becomes um, a social asset. You're also in good terms with the government, the local authority. Uh, you interact freely. You're able to express your ideas to them. You're able to express your grievances. Then that is a social uh, capacity. And then on the natural side, uh, the, the natural pillar, you have, um, you know, um, a borehole, for example, uh, that you're able to get water from, or um, you have, uh, uh, you know, some uh, vegetation within your homestead that, uh, you know, can shield, shield you from uh, direct sunlight. So that becomes, um, an, uh, you know, an environmental um, capacity. And then economic, maybe you have uh, uh, some few chicken that you're rearing, you have um, a, a small um, business that you're running, uh, you have um, uh, access to finances from your local bank or local, uh, local savings um, platform. So that is your capacity at that time. And then physical is, uh, uh, you could say you have good internet connectivity, uh, you have um, a nearby school uh, that, you know, your, your children can still go to school, uh, you know, uh, th that becomes your capacity to cope with the drought at that time. So once you're done with that, you'll just uh, uh, try to weigh. So this is uh, for you to decide that between the uh, vulnerabilities that we've established and between, uh, you know, and the capacities that we've also established, which one is more? And then based on that, you will be able to uh, fill your battery bars um, to the level that you feel expresses or, or you know, resonates with your level of resilience on that uh, pillar. So if you have, um, you know, like an eight on, on human, then that means you're fairly uh, resilient on the human aspect. If you have uh, a two on the economic pillar, then that means you're barely resilient on the human um, aspect. So that is how you will establish how to, um, uh, uh, you know, assess your level of resilience uh, based on one particular um, stress or shock. And just to uh, mention that you can only use a resilience battery for one particular uh, stress or shock. You cannot have floods and drought and heat waves on the same um, battery because then that means you'll be having uh, mixed information and that will confuse the data. Um, so, uh, uh, with that information, um, it would be good for you to uh, try and come up with your own batteries. Uh, so that means you draw um, your, uh, your resilience batteries. You'll have around 10 minutes to do that. You can draw your resilience batteries, and then you can also um, identify one stress or shock that you think your community is uh, uh, highly vulnerable to, and then uh, you can also uh, try and establish what are the vulnerabilities based on the five assets or the five, five pillars and what are the uh, capacities. And then after that, uh, we'll get back and then I'll take you through uh, how to do an action planning with the resilience batteries tool alone. Um, so it would be interesting for you to uh, spare some few minutes, maybe 10 minutes uh, to do your own resilience batteries and then uh, when that time elapses, we'll uh, get back and uh, a few of you can share what they have and then we can now see uh, how to change these vulnerabilities and capacities into um, opportunities for action planning. Uh, is there a 
Any questions or additions even from Claudia? Thank you, Ken. I think that was a fantastic introduction. And just to say that Ken's been doing an amazing work um, both in um, Kenya, where he's leading a volunteer platform there and working with volunteers using the batteries, but he's also done some fantastic work for VSO in Ethiopia using the batteries, both to monitor personal resilience. So you can use this for your own resilience and um, thinking about what shocks and stresses you're facing and what you what your current resilience is and what your vulnerabilities are and how to strengthen that. And um, but you can also use it to plan actions with the communities and, and Ken's been doing both. Um, so it's great to have your first hand guidance, Ken. Um, and yeah, just encourage everyone to get a pen and pencil. Let's start developing our own batteries. I think it, once you start using them for yourself, you can really see how they work. Um, and if you can, as Ken guided, draw those five columns, one column for the resilience inside of you, your human resilience. And as Ken said, that represents your knowledge, your skills, your capacities, and things like your nutrition or health that might impact on your internal resilience. Um, and then the second column um, will represent your social resilience. Um, and then do three more columns for your environmental resilience, your physical resilience, and your economic resilience. And once you've drawn those five columns, think about the main climate shock or stress. So this can be used for any shock or stress. It could be used for economic, it could be used even for a bereavement. You can use it for any shock or stress. But for this exercise, we're going to focus on climate resilience. So if you think about the key climate shock or stress that you're most impacted by or is most impacting your community um, or you're most worried about, what is that climate shock or stress that you feel most vulnerable to? And once you've identified it might be a flood, drought, typhoon, then you can start thinking about your existing resilience levels to that shock or stress. Are your vulnerabilities very, very high? Uh, or are your capacities high? What kind of um, resilience can you um, depend on if you experience that shock or stress? Um, and as Ken mentioned, if you've got very, very low resilience, if your vulnerabilities are quite high, you put in one, two, three. If you feel that you've got a lot of information and skills um, or, or um, support to cope with that shock or stress, you'll put in a higher level. Um, and think about your, for each of the different types of resilience, what your level is. As Ken said, you focus on one stress or shock. You can do a lot of batteries for different types of stress or shock, but for each um, batteries do one stress or shock. So let's just focus on one stress and shock for this um, and then try to fill out your batteries. How resilient are you? How resilient is your human battery? How resilient is your social battery? How resilient is your natural battery? What are the natural environments you're living in? And do you feel that it's very vulnerable to that shock or stress? Or do you think that you've actually got quite a lot of natural resources, good water quality, um, a lot of natural benefits where you're living? Okay. And if you can do that on a pen, pencil, if you're happy, we'd love after, you know, in about five minutes, you're very welcome to share. We'd love to hear um, what, your, what your batteries are. Um, but just take maybe about three or four more minutes to finish those batteries. And then we'll go on to the next part, which is how we develop an action plan um, from this process. So I'll give you three or four minutes to finish those batteries, and then we'll start our resilience action planning.
hopefully everything is going well with everyone. Um, so if you're done with your uh, personal resilience batteries, uh, you can uh, put it in the chat. You can uh, put a comment in the chat to let us know or just raise your hand. Give us a thumbs up. So as you wind up, uh, do not struggle to put a lot of information in it. We just want you to get the concept of how to uh, use the battery screws for resilience building. So uh, if you have just a few uh, vulnerabilities and a few capacities for each of the pillars, uh, that should be fine um, so that you can also um, uh, go to the next session. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. So let's look and see, um, how is everybody doing? Do we have any batteries that anyone would like to share? Thank you, Sophie, we've got thumbs up from Sophie. Um, anybody else? <laughs> Sophie's saying it's quite tricky. Sophie, would you like to unmute and just share your experience and what you found was tricky? Um, and also, if you'd like to share what you feel the key um, risk is, the climate risk that you're concerned about um, and how your different levels were. Did you find some of your human levels were different than your environmental or your physical? Were there difference in the levels of each type of resilience? I'd love to hear your experience, Sophie, maybe you can share with us. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, I, think, I think what I found tricky is like how far, how wide I go sort of almost geographically from where I'm sitting. So like, um, you know, just thinking about sort of my flat, um, like for, for a physical point of view, and building and then but then the city and the country you know there's quite a lot of different levels of resilience and um I think that's what I found tricky I here in the UK my concern would be flooding I think we regularly have quite severe um flooding events and where I am in London is pretty low lying um on the river floodplain so I was thinking about that quite a lot um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the human um, one was tricky because you're sort of assessing your own skills in many ways. And, and um, you know, I think that one was potentially lower. I don't know if I do have um, the skills to adapt if there, for example, was a flood. You know, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, but, you know, then from the point of view of sort of work, hopefully, you know, I'd be have skills that are adaptable in terms of livelihood to some extent. But anyway, it's very interesting because I sort of could have put a number of different scores in any bucket, depending on what angle I came from. And I guess that's why um, you were talking about, you know, having different batteries for different events and you could have different batteries for sort of different um um, elements of your life I guess as well but yeah really interesting and more complicated than it first appears when you look at that great sketch um, that's so beautifully simple. I think that's the secret of resilience Sophie is trying to simplify what's quite complex and we usually start simple um, and then the complexity starts to emerge but really great reflections and you're right I think um with batteries, we can take different levels. So it's a tool that we can really use in terms of what our context is. So you could use it just for your own personal, you know, um, the building, or usually we use it at community level. So, you know, different communities might define a community in a different way. So um, it really depends on how you define a community or how with your personal um, resilience, how wide you go. So you might be quite mobile that you can consider a larger um, set of resources if you're quite, um, 
um, limited in terms of how far you can you know, travel from your community, you might have a lower amount of resources that you can tap into. So the scale is important. But the, also the important thing is it's, there's no wrong or right with the batteries. It's really about you being able to assess the different things that lead to your resilience. Um, and plans. So we're going to go into our next step now when we're starting to use it as a planning tool. Um, it's not necessarily the levels don't matter, um, but the levels are able to guide us in terms of where we feel we need to focus and prioritise for our resilience actions. Um, so thank you that, for that, Sophie. Um, would anybody else like to share what, um, what stress or shock they focused on and if they had any observation about their levels, if they were different um, between different types of resilience? Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Moya from Nigeria. I hope you can hear me. We can, Moya. Welcome. Thank you. So um, I think they they are kind of funny because they come either positively or negatively. So it's it's they get, they get each other. Sometimes it's meant to make the battery go up, but when you look at the other side, <laughs> then it comes down. So for me, the human part, I would say um, is about six, um, coupled with the fact that um, we're working from home and um, it's a lot. So sometimes you could have the energy, but when you're, when you're adding it up with um, the house chores and being a mother of two, um, there is a lot that comes with that. And yeah, so that's, I'll put it at five for Moya, social. Sorry, uh, the, um, yes. sorry. Um, maybe you can start by telling us which stress or shock did you identify? Human. Yeah, so um, so look, so is it flooding? Is it uh, the coronavirus pandemic? Is it, uh, so what was- Yeah, I just put the COVID, 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 because we're working remotely okay. from home. So most of them are really affected for me. Um, so the social is also working from home and you really don't have um, that part of trying to differentiate um, which one or what you're doing and how to match them. So um, it's still, social is really low at the moment here. I work remotely for over an hour, over, over a year. So it's telling on, on some of the things I do. Yeah, so that's it. I would have loved you to move to the next slide so that I look at the battery level and what it is. Ken? Yeah. Um. yeah so just move to the battery, yes. Uh, for natural, I would say, funny enough, this is not cutting across all the country for us in Nigeria, but where I am, it's really, um, it's not floody. It's, it's good. The rain comes at due season and not so heavy now. So, um, it comes more like um, eight. We see some of the crops growing. We we have a good weather, and it helps sometimes to keep the mind in in, in shape. Then for economic, yes, um, despite the hardship and everything, we still have some of um, the the for me as a person going. So I'll put that eight. Uh, for physical, I'll put that seven, um, and not just. Um, COVID or anything, but for other engagements with lots of um, um, issues and um, youth network and doing lots. So sometimes trying to balance it. Um, so I'll put that seven. But mostly the human and social is really affected by COVID. The natural is, uh, for me, is not affected, but helped to boost it <laughs> by, by, by boosting the natural for me. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Moyo. And um, yeah, the COVID-19 uh, is actually the perfect example for us to use and understand how to go about uh, using the batteries tool. Uh, a few reflections, um, even from um, uh, Sophie, I think, who presented uh, before, is that sometimes you might be uh, a bit confused on which shock or stress to, um, to settle for. And during our uh, resilience building um, process and uh, during, uh, during the uh, vulnerability and capacity assessment, we use different set of tools. And uh, if you use tools like a historical timeline, then you would, you would identify various stresses and shocks. And then after that, you'd prioritize based on uh, the impact uh, it has on the community, on livelihoods, on health and education, you'd be uh, able to prioritize and rank which is uh, the most um, pressing issue. 
So that way, uh, the one that ranks number one would be automatically used for the resilience building uh, process or for uh, the batteries because uh, the batteries is also supposed to bring out um, actions that need to be taken to address uh, a very urgent uh, concern. So you'd prioritize uh, one or two and then use uh, the batteries tool for that. Um, something else is uh, you would use uh, only one uh, stress or shock, like I said earlier, that you'd only settle for one and use it for all uh, the pillars. So if you identify, for example, uh, flooding, then on the human pillar, you'd only be, you'll only be looking at flooding. So how vulnerable are you in terms of your uh, information, your uh, physical ability, your health, uh, the knowledge that you have on that particular flooding alone? If it is social, then you're looking at how do you relate with others? Uh, what kind of support do you have uh, from the people around you uh, to be able to uh, you know, deal with flooding? Or is that kind of relationship making you vulnerable to that flooding and so forth? Um, if you look at economics, then again, it will only be uh, um, looking towards uh, flooding. So um, you would not have uh, the human pillar looking at, um, say, flooding, and then the social pillar looking at uh, COVID-19, and then a natural pillar looking at earthquakes and so forth. Uh, so that means you're bringing on board different stress and shocks for the same battery tool. So we consider uh, all these five pillars in the batteries uh, from human, social, uh, environmental, physical, and, and, and economic. Uh, you'd have that for one shock or stress. And then if you have another shock or stress that you want to identify, or, or mean you want to establish your level of resilience for, then you'd also have a different set of these five batteries to uh, establish that. And uh, to answer, uh, Edel's um, question, uh, she's asking for me, I realized I'm very dependent on local and national government and the, and the interventions they take. I was wondering how, how uh, to use it. So if you have good relations with the government, uh, with the local authority, if, if they're, you're able to um, speak to them, you're able to interact with them, they're able to understand your concerns, then that is a social uh, capacity because uh, you are able to relate well with those around you. And if it's the government, if it's uh, the, even your family members, uh, then that becomes a capacity. If you do not have uh, that sort of close relationship, then that becomes a vulnerability. And because uh, many, many people actually in, uh, in most countries are dependent on the actions by the government, then you just classify those actions where they fall. If uh, the government has not built uh, enough you know, roads uh, that can connect you to different uh, services and, and resources, then that becomes a physical vulnerability. If your government has provided a lot of financial support, uh, there's a lot of access to finance, uh, even in terms of uh, various stress and shocks, and that becomes an economic capacity. If uh, your government has not, um, uh, you know, put in place programs and interventions to increase, say, say tree cover, or to um, provide access to clean water for everyone, then that becomes um, you know, a vulnerability. So it is just how you classify the service or um, you know, interventions that the government is supposed to take based on these five pillars. Um, so thanks for sharing everyone. Um, uh, do we have someone else? Or even Clara, do you have some, something to add? I might suggest, Ken, that we go on to the action planning process now. Now that you have your levels and you know what your level of human resilience is to that shock or stress, um, what can we do now to develop an action plan? So, Ken, can you maybe go into um, how you've used it to start identifying actions and developing an action plan for resilience? Okay, thank you. So, uh, the question that we ask ourselves normally is when you have um, a low battery on your phone, what do you do? You charge it. It's simply that. You charge your batteries. So in uh, resilience building using the, uh, the batteries tool, what uh, the levels that you have there, so like if you can look at the screen, uh, the levels that you have there already are your levels of resilience for that particular stress or shock. Uh, and what you need to do is you need to charge your battery so that it gets to 100%, it gets to 10 over 10. 
and that will call for you to establish what you need to do to be able to fill up your batteries, to be able to have your batteries charged. Uh, so this will form uh, uh, the actions that need to be taken. Uh, the opportunities are there to fill in the gap uh, that is left in your battery. So if you look at, uh, say, uh, the human um, pillar, if you are at 80% resilience uh, on the human pillar, um, it could be against um, COVID-19 or it could be against flooding, uh, then what actions do you need to take to make sure that your battery is full, fully charged, that you are fully um, um, you know, resilient in the face of uh, flooding? So it could be having um, to go through capacity building process uh, to enhance your skills and knowledge to deal with, uh, uh, you know, to deal with uh, uh, different stress and so for that particular one. So in this case, I would use, uh, uh, say, drought. Uh, so what actions do you need to take to make sure that the vulnerabilities that you established are reduced? So remember uh, the third uh, stage of the third process in building resilience is identify how to reduce those vulnerabilities um, on your battery that you've already established. So if one vulnerability was, you know, you lack information on uh, uh, how to grow uh, climate resilient crops, or, you know, or, or drought, drought resistant crops, then you'd have to go through training or capacity development to be able to have that skills and knowledge uh, to be aware of what to do in the event of a flooding, uh, uh, sorry, in the event of, of uh, drought. So that becomes one action plan already. And you do the same for social. If you have uh, poor relations with your, um, your family members, if you have uh, bad relations with the government, then what do you need to do? You need to, um, uh, have uh, probably consultative meetings with uh, with the local authorities. You need to uh, include them in your uh, processes. You need to uh, make sure that they resonate well with uh, the challenges that you experience in the community, and that becomes an action uh, point. Uh, if it is uh, a physical, there isn't a good access um, of roads. Uh, these poor road networks uh, within uh, your marginalized area. Uh, there is not enough electricity in, you know, in, your, in your community. There is not enough um, uh, you know, schools and hospitals. Um, so these are physical amenities and, and infrastructure that are uh, when addressed or when provided, then your level of resilience will go up. So that becomes an action plan. And you do the same for all of these um, five batteries, five pillars. So uh, that is basically how to uh, change your vulnerabilities into opportunities, and those will form your action plan. Now, something to note with the action plan is uh, for each action plan, um, also try to um, agree or establish who is responsible. Because once you say uh, capacity uh, building or you need to conduct a training on uh, drought, resi uh, drought resistant crops, then who is going to provide it? It could be the Ministry of Agriculture, it could be a, a certain CBO or a certain NGO that works in the agricultural sector. So that becomes uh, the role player. That is the person or who is, uh, uh, you know, the stakeholder who is going to be in charge of that. Uh, you also probably um, want to have a timeline so that you, you have a smart um, action plan. So that is uh, time bound. So it could be within three months, within one year, and that gives it a more realistic approach in uh, addressing that particular action plan. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, any additions. And then maybe just as an addition, um, as I said on the chat panel, so often if we're doing this for our own resilience, obviously we can use it both for our you know, what, what our level of resilience is now and what we need to do. Um, but we can also use it to monitor changes. And um, so you can see in this visual and um, prepared by another colleague of ours, um, he has looked at the levels before in 2017 um, of, of resilience um, of a group of, of um, participants in our, our work. Um, and then also the levels that 
um, had been achieved by 2019 that our primary actors were reporting um, and they were reporting actually some increases in their resilience and assets across all the different five um, levels. Um, so if we do batteries regularly um, ourselves, we can monitor how our resilience changes and if the actions we've identified are working or not. Um, but we can also do it in our work so we can monitor changing resilience of the communities we're working in as well using this tool um, and use it to revise and update our action plans. So you can use resilience batteries yourselves, you know, each month and come back and see if your resilience is changing, but you can also use it as a monitoring evaluation tool um, in your communities to see what is changing and get recommendations back um, in terms of what can be done to improve um, the work that we do. Um, so it's both um, a planning tool, but also a monitoring and evaluation. So I encourage you, um, as Ken said, think about those batteries you've already drawn Think about the actions, each of the different levels. Think about one action you can take to strengthen your own resilience. Um, and if you want to come back from, from month to month, from week to week, and see if your resilience is increasing. And bear in mind, sometimes our resilience levels will drop. It's not always going to increase. Um, circumstances outside of our control might impact on our resilience levels as well. Um, but the secret is to be able to absorb and recover as quick as we can. Now, we are going to go on to our next session um, and we're going to look at our dashboard. So once you've done an action plan in the community, how can we start monitoring um, that work? How can we start reporting it to local government? How can we start reflecting on, on what the um, information, the risk information is telling us? And in VSO over the last year, we've developed a dashboard um, which we are using to communicate all the different community resilience plans that we're doing and start to reflect on what are the different risks and vulnerabilities and actions we're seeing coming out across the different communities we're working in. So in VSO, we're working in over 15 community, uh, sorry, 15 countries, and we've done um, re resilience planning in both communities and schools. So we'd love to introduce you to our dashboard, which will show the different picture of resilience we're seeing across all of those countries and we're going to invite you to develop our own dashboard within this session we'll develop our own climate risk dashboards um, as part of the next session so i'm going to hand it a big thank you to um ken for your um great sharing and hand over to my colleague sheen um who has been developing the dashboard for vso to look at resilience across our countries Yeah. So thanks, Ken and Claude. So uh, the dashboard that you're currently seeing, uh, this is being hosted in uh, Power BI. But the intake uh, forms that we use to gather this um, assessment information or those monitoring data uses a Hobo Toolbox uh, solution. So as you may uh, already know, uh, Hobo Toolbox is one of the uh, publicly uh, available solutions uh, that we can use in our uh, data collection work for say assessments that uh, we need to deploy in areas where internet uh, connection is uh, unavailable or sometimes unreliable. So in this uh, solution uh, that we have um, developed through the uh, safe, peaceful and uh, resilient communities, we have deployed uh, the vulnerability and uh, risk assessment form using uh, the Cobo toolbox. So um, if you decide uh, to use a similar or Cobo, to use Cobo toolbox in uh, the work that you're doing, uh, you can just actually uh, create an account uh, via this um, site. Uh, just need to go to uh, Cobo toolbox. Oops. Let me... So it's cobotoolbox.org. Cobotoolbox.org. So this is where uh, you can create uh, the account. I'm sharing the wrong screen, so it's here. So in Cobotoolbox.org, um, you'll be presented with an option uh, to either use the uh, humanitarian, uh, the, the server being hosted for humanitarian organizations, or the server uh, that was uh, th that is being hosted for researchers and aid workers. So from here, you can create your account. Uh, the once you create your account, a link will be sent to your email uh, that will uh, validate the uh, account creation. And then from there, 
um, you get to create the form. So there are also uh, various ways to deploy a form or how to digitize, digitalize your um, intake sheet. So uh, the easiest way uh, would be uh, from here. So you just need to, once your uh, Hobo toolbox is deployed, you just need to click in here. You build from uh, scratch. And then the good thing with uh, Hobo is that, oops, let me create this one, a test project. So the good thing with Kobo is that it comes with a uh, form builder. So the for form builder is just a, uh, like a click and uh, drop uh, feature of Kobo. So like, for example, here, we create a question, test, and then you, you are presented with the uh, various options on how you want that question uh, to be configured. So for example, the most common one is uh, select one, select many, or if you want a, a category, uh, you can also just click this one and put the uh, categories or the choices in here. So let me discard this one. So Sorry, now Jim. I will... Uh Sorry, uh, we can't see the screen you're working on. Oops, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, wait. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, so this is the uh, site. So the kobotoolbox.org, I hope uh, you're able to see it now. So this is the site. I'll just, and then uh, the other one that I'm talking about is this. And you share this one. So... Uh, that's the, uh, the the previous one is the Hobo Toolbox um, uh, site where you can create your form. And then he, this one is the uh, the Kobo Toolbox uh, account that I have. So what I've mentioned earlier was on how to uh, create a form in Kobo. Oops, let me log in first. Yeah, so I'll just... Uh, recap that quickly so it is here where you can create the uh, the form or where you can digitize the um, intake sheet or monitoring form that you have so you just need to click a uh, new and then build from scratch and then here let's enter the dummy title let's create that project and then yeah so uh, Hobo uh, have a form builder so you can just click uh, or drag and drop so for example this one we create a test question here, test question, and then you can configure uh, that question, uh, whether you want it to be like a multiple uh, choice uh, type of question, whether you want it to be in a text uh, a, a text response um, a question, or you want, you want a photo to, uh, as a response for that question, or even a location. For example, this one, location. For location, uh, there is this um, line. So uh, for line, th th this one traces the uh, route wherein the um, where, where the enumerator uh, passes through. So let's use this one for point. This is just for uh, tagging the locations. For, so for this one, um, I'll show I'll show you how it looks like. So let's go here. For example, uh, that one. So, that one. so uh, yeah, the configuration here is point. So point looks like this. So this is where uh, uh, we collect uh, the information that we use to populate the uh, dashboards. So uh, starting from this, uh, let me share the uh, link to you so that you can uh, try to fill it up. I have just posted the link uh, to this form in the chat box. So uh, you can uh, try to fill it up based on the uh, context uh, from the country or place where you are from. So uh, th this one, uh, th we have created this for the purpose of this um, um, exercise. So uh, for this uh, geo point, so the, the, uh, there are three uh, ways to populate the data. The first one is to just search search the place for example let me search for um, Mozambique. Mozambique yeah when you search that the map will redirect you to that particular place and then from there you can pinpoint uh, the location and the other uh, option is to just click this button detect current location and that will uh, automatically uh, pinpoint the location where uh, the device or the numerator is currently um, located and then let's put here country 
Philippines and then yeah maybe we can uh, can we do it together uh, can everyone open the link and let's uh, do do the uh, do this together Oh, yeah, we receive a question uh, and, a, and a comment. Is it accessible everywhere but may be blocked in certain contexts that it, as it is used to gather a survey data? You can try to find out from our IT team. Yeah, so in some places, um, we, there are uh, certain restriction, restrictions, uh, especially uh, in the context of the uh, general data uh, protection regulation. So, yeah. So anyway, um, if we can try to do this together uh, and answer uh, the responses, then after this, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to show you uh, the dashboard that we can uh, deploy quickly. So actually, this, uh, the, this particular intake sheet, uh, we developed this in less than uh, five minutes just for this um, exercise. So uh, just to, uh, what do you call this? That, just to show you how easy you can deploy a, a similar solution that you can use for an assessment. So yeah, for this one, what is the biggest climate risk in your community? Uh, let's try to put here flood. And then who is the most uh, vulnerable uh, to this risk? Uh, let's try to check children, women and girls, people with disability. Why are they most vulnerable to this risk? Test response. What actions are needed? Test action. And then after I submit that data, That should show up here. And as Sheen is putting um, that data in, um, just to encourage everyone to have a look in the um, chat side ch chat and see if you can click into the link. That should take you directly into the form that Sheen's developed. But if you've got any issues accessing it, um, we can add your data for you. So we'd love if you can put in, if you can't access the COBA form, if you can tell us what country you're in, what's the location, um, your location, whereabouts in that country, what is the main climate risk you feel is the biggest risk in that context, who is most vulnerable and why, um, and any actions that need to be taken. So I'm gonna add those questions to the side chat. If you can't put this directly on the COBA form, don't worry, share that with us and we can put it in the COBA form for you. Um, and in our work, often we will collect this information in communities and then add it to the COBO after. Um, but you can also use it, you can also gather the data in real time. Um, so you can use it, you know, um, you can collect it in the communities. But if you can't um, access the form, put it in the side chat and we'll add your risks to the dashboard that we're developing together. Um, and I'll put the questions on the side chat so everyone can see them. Yeah, thanks for that, Claudia. Okay, so um, hopefully everyone is able to access the COBO. Um, if you're struggling to access the COBO, please raise your hand and we can give you some support um, or else you can answer the questions I've just put in the sides panel. Um, if you can access COBO, please do fill it in the information. I'm really looking forward to seeing this dashboard start to take shape. Uh, 
Uh, so we're now seeing uh, data uh, coming in. So we have one from uh, the United Kingdom, one from India, another one from Kenya, and one from the Philippines. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so this one is in uh, Nepal. I'm sorry for my mute. So we're seeing here that the the what do you call this the, the biggest climate risk that they have identified. Uh, we have here uh, flood, drought, heat waves. So three have responded that uh, flood is the biggest climate risk. Another three responded that it is drought. One responded heat wave. So the colors also indicate on where these um, uh, climate risk. Are located so yeah so here we see that the uh, drought it's here in Kenya we also have one here in South Africa and another one somewhere in uh, Nigeria yeah, so basically this is how the uh, uh, the uh, built-in uh, dashboard works in a uh, hobo toolbox so um, aside from this, there are also other options wherein um, we can uh, make a more, uh, we can create more features and filters in, into the dashboard. So one of the ways is to actually use um, API connectors. So that means that uh, this data uh, from the Cobo server is being sync, sync to uh, software such as the uh, Power BI. So that is how um, VSO is able to uh, populate uh, its dashboard on vulnerability and uh, risk monitoring. So, yeah. So, aside from uh, Power BI, uh, another option that we know is uh, using uh, Google uh, Data Studio. So, you can, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages in doing that, but basically, um, these uh, solutions, Power BI and the data, uh, the Google Data Studio, uh, provides a more convenient access for uh, users, especially if uh, they are not really, uh, I mean, you know, they are not very familiar with uh, this kind of uh, uh, solutions like go going into Kobo and, you know, uh, going into the, uh, the different buttons of it. So if you use uh, Power BI or uh, Google Data Studio or other similar solutions where you can uh, connect that API and have that data sync, uh, you can actually uh, produce a, a dashboard that you can share using a link. So that's how it works. And yeah, uh, back to you, Claudia. Thank you so much, Sheen. Can we see that dashboard again? Let's see the creation that we've developed in this session. I think it's really fantastic to see all the different locations people are reporting from. Um, so we we um, and, and look at some of the spread of the climate risks in those different locations. It seems that in some of the Asian locations, we're looking at floods as one of the key risks that people are reporting that they're worried about. Um, and then in some of the um, sub-Saharan African contexts, we're really seeing drought as a critical um, issue. Why do we have a drought in the middle of the sea, though, Sheen? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so the possible reason here is that um, the user uh, may have uh, selected the location based on uh, the pinpoint and maybe he have uh, dragged that pinpoint in this, uh, you know, uh, outside of the uh, land. But uh, what I'm guessing is that the, this is for uh, th this data comes from Nigeria. So we can look into it. So here, yeah, so uh, the user have indicated the country to be South Africa and it's a drought and for the location 
Yeah, so uh, the user did not uh, pinpoint the exact location. Ah, uh, I see. So maybe started. you can fix that. Can you put that in South Africa, maybe, just so we have that map, we can share it at the end of this um, session. I think we can share it on the conference website and just show that what we've developed together. Um, it's really fantastic. Can anyone um, maybe unmute and um, if you've got any questions for Sheen or if you had any challenges accessing Kobo, you might want to ask Sheen or just share your experience. Um, how useful do you find the dashboard and the Kobo survey? Um, and then maybe um, Sheen, if you're okay to flick on to um, just the map that people have developed together, we'll have a look in a little bit more depth at the VSO map after to show how we're using it so we can share a little bit of the functionality with you after. But first of all, let's look at our own map. Um, yeah, we can see, oh, flood for, okay. So Sophie, maybe um, you said you put in a flood for London, but there's also a heat wave reported in London as well. So it might be um, um, obscured. We might, can you zoom in to London, Sheen, just to see if we've got two risks reported from London? Yeah. Yeah, for London. United Kingdom. Uh, we got one. Oops, sorry. I think uh, let let me zoom in. Ah, yeah. There's uh, there are two risks. Uh, one is um, heat wave. The other one is flood. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you. So as you zo zoom in, you can see the more detailed location. I think that's what's quite useful. If you actually put exact location, you can look at even the same country. Different communities might experience different risk and different groups, as we said, women, children, older people might actually prioritize different risks. So we can paint a really big picture then of the risks that we are seeing across different communities, but also scale up to global context. Um, and it's interesting, I don't know if anyone would like to share about the heat wave risk, because I think this is something that we're seeing increasing and a lot of deaths from heat wave. Would, would anyone like to share who put that um, heat wave risk in and why you think that's a priority? Or maybe someone else would like to share the risk that they entered and, and maybe the reason for it. So would anyone like to share um, what they've entered or if anyone had any issues entering it, please also share. If you would like to enter something but it didn't appear, um, please let us know. Okay, so I don't think we've got many, many questions coming in, but um, if everyone is happy then, um, let's go into the VSO dashboard. We can just share um, how we've been using the dashboards just in a little bit more detail. So you can see actually how useful this information maybe can be. And again, this is something we've only started using in the last year. Um, so we're still discovering new ways to use it. Um, so Sheen, if you can look at the dashboard one more time and then we can talk through it. Yeah, so uh, this is the vulnerability and risk monitoring monitoring dashboard that was developed for uh, VSO's um, exercises. So what, what you see in here are uh, first is the uh, map. So the map uh, provides us with the information on the location of uh, various hazards. So within that map, uh, you also see uh, pie charts. So this one um, um, indicates the uh, number of uh, hazards uh, that have been identified uh, from that location. And then aside from that, uh, you also see the, um, the bar graph. So here uh, we see that um, 35.71 of those assessments that have been conducted by VSO across, uh, the, uh, across countries, across the globe, uh, is saying that um, the top uh, risk uh, that they experience or have been identified in that uh, location is flood. Uh, followed by drought and uh, solid and plastic waste. So aside from that, uh, we also have here uh, filters uh, to, to determine, for example, uh, if we want to know uh, which countries is this uh, is flood being the uh, priority risk or hazard. So if we click on that one, so we see here that uh, 
Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and communities in Myanmar have identified drought to be uh, among the uh, priority uh, risk or hazard. So as apart from that, uh, we also have here a tracker of the emergency support that VSO uh, have provided to these communities. So for example, in the case of Nigeria, so we see here that uh, in, in Nigeria, uh, we were able to provide emergency support to uh, the primary number of primary actors as indicated in here and the type of assistance also indicated in here being a cash uh, voucher. And then aside from that, uh, we also have here a table where, uh, wherein uh, the, uh, the risk and uh, the countries where these uh, assessments have been conducted are being summarized. So this is just a snapshot of the data that we have uh, from the backboard. So there are uh, details uh, in the assessment that are av available uh, from the back end. Uh, what you see in here, uh, we assume would give us um, information uh, that would uh, that can inform uh, decision making in uh, program development or in interventions being uh, carried out by the government or the private sector. So, for example, here in uh, Nigeria, in uh, in the assessment that have been conducted by the community, uh, this particular community uh, in Nigeria. Uh, they have identified drought to be the priority hazard and there are three other uh, hazards identified in there and uh, here uh, the priority intervention that they have uh, identified includes community awareness training, dissemination of IEC materials and this priority intervention are being uh, categorized into uh, different components. The components that was mentioned by Ken a while ago, human, environmental, physical, social and economic. So this is how uh, the data are being summarized, can be summarized in dashboards uh, like this. So apart from this, uh, you can also explore other functionalities of uh, Power BI or uh, open source uh, softwares that uh, you can use. Yeah. So uh, back to you, uh, Cloda. Many thanks. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about the dashboard or you'd like to try yourself, please do get in contact with us. We're very happy to help you with it. Um, and just to say, Flavia, so we do have plans to train our youth volunteers and community volunteers to continue to monitor using Kobo in their communities and report any new risks. Um, and as one of our participants earlier was saying, it's a good tool to communicate with national and local government what the different changes of risks are. And if there's an emergency and support is needed, um, if we link up to the national systems, it's a good way to share what the context of communities is as well. So we're hoping that we'll be using this process to engage with local and national government on risk monitoring and risk action. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch if you want to hear more. And thank you for your participation in creating our very own um, climate resilience dashboard in this session. It was, it was great to see what you were reporting from your context. And we've got one final Skillshare session and we've got a, a wonderful guest who's a partner of VSO who's been doing excellent work in Nigeria on, and, and also has been training our youth volunteers globally on climate change and climate action. Um, and um, Lucky um, is, the, um, is um, representing um, um, CS DevNet um, from Nigeria and I'd love to introduce him um, and also he will be sharing with us campaigning tools. How can we develop um, a climate campaign and what is he doing? Um, what are the climate campaigns they're leading and how can you get involved? So welcome Lucky um, and um, thank you all for your participation in our third session, which is on climate change campaigning. We've looked at our resilience planning. We've looked at our resilience monitoring through the dashboard. And now let's look at climate campaigning to see how we can sh share those skills with, with each other. So Lucky, hopefully you are able to unmute um, and share a little bit about your work. Hi, Lucky. Yeah, hi. Good morning, um, everybody. I'm so happy to, to be here. I'm trying to follow the conversation from Ken's uh, resilience battery presentation and up to, to this point. Uh, I'm really happy 
uh, to be in this uh, skill share session for, for today. So my name is Haben Loki, and um, I work with Climate and Sustainable Development Network, CS DevNet. So uh, the particular skill share I'll be uh, sharing with us today is on our climate campaign um, framework we designed last year. Uh, we discovered that uh, amidst the pandemic, uh, for us as civil society, uh, one of our main strengths is on advocacy, sensitization, and uh, awareness raising. Uh, so we designed uh, uh, a campaign to titled Sustaining Climate Advocacy in the Era of the Pandemic, and uh, we adopted an hashtag uh, that is called what, is, what Has Changed. We for for the month on the review where we've had unfortunately I, I must apologize I, I had a slight presentation for this but um, I'm juggling between two sessions to to try and um, be part of this particular session so um, I had to join this session with the phone. Uh, we designed uh, a campaign called What Has Changed, centered around climate change, and what we basically looked at was to look at Nigerian government engagement at the UNFCCC how fast Nigeria fed and um, how we're doing and what, what is there that needs to be improved. And um, within the month under engagement, we've recorded uh, amazing successes. We've had uh, policies uh, reviewed by the government and uh, yeah, and the, the two, the most recent two, one is on wash and then one is uh, on electricity, access to clean energy. We have currently on our framework about um, 30 young persons, climate activists, who are championing this and um, engaging government at all levels, from local levels to, to the national level. We have engaged and uh, the success story so far has been encouraging because uh, some of the youth who have been engaging with this What Has Changed campaign we, we look at um, issues of um, agriculture, we look at issues of um, forest conservation, we look at issues, nature-based solution, biodiversity, a whole range, uh, as long as it's connected to, to climate change and sustainable development. Uh, and the results that we've recorded so far has been huge. But of course, there are challenges that we have also encountered, challenges of um, some identified partners not willing to respond to, to conversations that young persons want to have with them. But also success stories are also built around young persons giving stories like, oh, their capacities have, have been built to, to be able to engage. Some other, some other um, youth have also shared success stories around uh, having MOUs with um, local governments for, to further the discussion. Uh, and these are the challenges that we have actually built on to see how we can improve um, engagement and uh, yeah, I think this, this is uh, how far I can share. I, I'll be open to questions. If we have questions or we we'll need clarity on, on any areas that we've been engaging, um, I'll be open to share. Excellent, thank you, Lucky. So Lucky, um, based, just a question for me, first of all, to kick us off. So based on your campaign, um, what are some of the key urgent issues that the campaign is raising? What were some of the key asks that people were asking for um, in relation to the climate um, actions that are needed going into UNFCC? And um, it'd be great to hear some reflections of what were coming out of the campaign um, and what the next steps are. Yeah, actually, you'd be amazed to, to hear some of, I, I wish, because I also had got some slides from questions and um, key areas um, where people ask questions, those who are considered relevant stakeholders. Um, so questions arises from, oh, um, what are the mitigation um, plans that the government is putting on ground if you are having a water exchange campaign centered on um, climate change? Um, some persons would like to get clarity on um, what policies, clear policies are there to back some of these campaigns that we are having. And what that also did for some of our, um, some of the youth that were engaged is that it, it, made, it, it made them further look for some of the climate change policies that are currently uh, on ground that needs to be revised. And I think what that did, it gave birth to the government seeing the need to 
to revise the Nigerian climate change policy document, which is um, which, which was passed, I think, last month. Um, so some other key questions and issues being raised. Of course, if you look at the Nigerian um, the Nigerian climate change um, drive, it was centered. The thematic area was centered on five um, core areas of agri um, health. Health. There was agri, there's health, and then there is um, energy, transportation. So these areas raised a lot of issues, and um, we, our our youth who have been engaging in this uh, water exchange campaign, some of them actually would run into issues, would not have the right answers to some of these questions. But of course, they run back to the office to ask for clarity and for help, and um, we've been try we've tried to address some of these um, questions as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lucky. Um, and then looking at going forward for us as a group, um, if we wanted to develop our own campaigns, can yes. you give us any steps or tips? What what can we do um, to develop our own climate change campaigns? And what steps would you advise if someone was interested in campaigning about climate change issue, both at local level maybe, um, but maybe also um, at national or global level? What would you advise in terms of setting up a climate campaign? Any top tips for us? I, I think first of all is identifying the issue, yeah. Um, and one of the things we tried doing with this campaign is to, is to encourage a bottom top approach. So engaging um, what we call community resource persons who are the community level, um, they identified some of these issues, some of these issues that also um, shaped what the topic for, for each month uh, would be. So um, if, we, if, if we're going to design um, a climate campaign or probably replicate what we have, to we'll also see the desired, I think first of all, it's centered on identifying what the climate change issue is because um, we have various um, um, different um, climate change issues according to uh, different levels. So it's identifying the issue first and then um, designing what looks like what will work because one of the problems we have now is there's a ban on Twitter in Nigeria. So identifying what um, platform or what medium will be used to, to run a campaign. For us, we are using Twitter, um, I think Facebook, and a little bit of um, Instagram. But now the social media over here is, on, is a little bit under attack. So it looks like uh, identifying what platforms we think works, and then identifying the issue, the climate change issue, and then a, a modality for for a campaign. Yeah, it could be um, online campaign. It could be on-site campaign, and um, and all. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Lucky. So really good tips in terms of how to set up a campaign, identifying the issue, and then um, in terms of joining existing campaigns, Lucky. Um, yes. I know that you currently have some campaigns ongoing, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and how can we join that in. And I'd love to invite um, maybe the participants in this session maybe to do a little bit of a hashtag message that they can yeah. contribute to your campaign. Yeah, I, I think I, I like the hashtag. We, we can agree on, um, um, on a hashtag we feel um, can also work. So for us, we are trying to also see how we can sustain the, the, the ongoing campaign with the, the young, they are called young digital activists and community resource persons. Uh, but also we are, we are at the stage of planning a movement building. Uh, it's also a campaign strategy, but for, for this part, we are, we, are, we are focusing on the vulnerable communities, um, leveraging on the, Civil society, um, civil community-based organizations (CBOs) at the community level to drive uh, um, this campaign, and we are open to to partnership to see how we can have this more robust and um, more inclusive. So it's a movement building to uh, for uh, climate justice, uh, calling for climate justice has been developed fully. 
but still open to, to partnership. And even the sustaining climate advocacy, it's supposed to end in, um, in two months' time because, of course, some of these persons we are engaging, these 30 young persons, they are being supported with uh, stipends for data and uh, maybe little organizing conferences. Uh, that engagement ends in two months' time. But climate change will not end in two months' time. Climate change will continue, the, the climate will continue changing and, and all of that. So we are open to, to um, sustaining the, the conversation, sustaining the advocacy, sustaining this uh, um, sensitization and um, awareness raising. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Lucky. So, Lucky, if I can ask you maybe. Is it possible to type in those campaign titles on the chat panel so everyone can see? Um, and if you have a link um, maybe to the Twitter feed um, that you would like us to share a message from this conference um, um, and um, tag your campaign in, I think we can, we can do that as part of our um, interactive experience. So please type in on the chat panel so everyone can see. And um, if you've got a link to the campaign, um, you can share it um, or if you've got um, just a title of the campaign and then we can all check in on it um, and see if we can um, um, share a message relating to it. And Simba, I think you had a really good point on the chat panel. So Simba, I think you had a suggestion for us as a group. Could you unmute and share that suggestion? Okay, good, I will. Yes, yes, Koda. Um, just adding to say, uh, I think generating our campaign strategy, it must be evidence terms of uh, from the information, the data that we have collected. I know Shin has highlighted uh, the dashboard in terms of the risk assessments that have been done. So that information also help us to create that campaign strategy and also the message uh, generating from what our youths have, have given us in terms of the information from the risk assessments that will have been conducted in our communities. So I, I thought it would be wise also to share this on this group. Excellent points, um, Sheen. So maybe um, as we wait for Lucky to share information about his campaign, let's reflect back on the session today and let's see whether we can generate our own campaign using some of the findings we had from our session. So initially, we looked at resilience, what resilience means, and we developed our own resilience batteries to look at vulnerabilities and capacities. And we also looked at the key climate risks that we're seeing across um, our, our work, which ones are the most concerned to us personally, and we developed our own action plan. The second session, we started looking across the global context, and we started mapping out some of those risks we're seeing. And we also looked at who were the most vulnerable groups and what some of their actions that we needed to support them might be. And um, so that was looking at the resilience dashboard, and we created our own dashboards um, and again, we're very ha happy if people want to take that dashboard forward in their own work to advise you on that. So that was our resilience dashboard, which gave us a bit more of a global context compared to our personal local context. Um, and finally, we've just heard from Lucky in terms of how to develop a climate campaign. So what kind of campaign that we would select um, and what kind of evidence and Simba's advice in terms of bringing some of that evidence that we're collecting at the risk level, the, the batteries and the dashboard, into a campaign. Um, so maybe a challenge for the end of this session, we're coming to the end, but can I ask each of you, or maybe one or two people, we're gonna give it two minutes. Could you on the chat panel, um, please share, um, coming from the session we've just done, any campaign messages, any advocacy messages um, that we could gather using the tools we've done in this session. So using either the batteries tool um, or also using the dashboards. Are there any key advocacy messages that we could actually bring to decision makers coming from this session? I'm going to give you two minutes to think about it. Um, and then hopefully, once you've got an idea for a, kind of a key advocacy campaign using the batteries tool or the resilience dashboard evidence, please type it on the chat panel. That's the final challenge to see if you're all awake by the end of this two hour marathon session and um, using all the skills that we've learned in this session. So please give a campaign message or an advocacy message that you feel you could gather using the tools that we've been using in the session today. Okay, so as you're thinking through your advocacy or your campaign message, 
um, we're going to open up our Jamboard that we started the session with. Um, and we're just going to share this with the journey. We've, we've looked at the batteries. We've looked at the dashboard. And now Sheen's going to introduce how you can actually put your own message on the Jamboard. So if you'd like to put a message on this Jamboard at the end of the session with your campaign idea, or maybe reflection from the session, um, I'm just going to ask Sheen to give us a little bit of guidance of how we can use this Jamboard and how you can populate this Jamboard with your own information, your own reflection. Yeah, okay. So first, let me share with you the link uh, to this Jamboard. Here's the link. I'm sending it over the chat box. Where's the chat box? So here's the link to the Jamboard. And then from here, you can actually uh, write your ideas using this um, sticky note. So just need to click this one. It's the fourth button uh, on, from here. So once you click that one, uh, write your idea and for example, Resilience. Resilience, click save, you'll be there once you're done. Now you see it from here. You can just drag, drag that card, put it somewhere. Or you can also use the uh, pen tool, but I think uh, it will be, uh, it will look more uh, orderly if we just use the uh, sticky note. Yeah, so we can uh, move it around. And yeah, so basically uh, that's the function that we need uh, for this um, exercise. Yeah, back to you, Claude. Thank you, Sheen. So um, we've got one campaign idea already, um, really good one, coming from um, John. Um, and he's, um, I think it's more methodology in terms of campaign drive, dialogue, and games he's, he's suggested. So maybe we can put that on the Jamboard. John, if you're able to unmute, It'd be great to hear what you mean by this statement for the campaign, to look at the campaign in Drive, Dialogue and Games. Please share your idea. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my idea. Uh, I, we, 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 I'm from, I'm, I'm Kaganga John and I'm working with a community based organization in Uganda on climate change and uh, food security. Uh, what I mean by campaign drive, we usually organize uh, people, or I mean, uh, like a, a uh, bicycles, like uh, we, we, we like, like a motor, motor, motor bike, and then uh, we it, it is a, a, uh, it, 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 it always attracts to have your message can be te, te, can be te, taken. You can use as well as a, 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 a spe, speakers. You would be driving a, a, a bicycle when you are disseminating the information when you are trying to pull it is like a, 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 a gathering puller like a that's that's what i was that's what i was i i, I meant and also sometime we we have been organizing for example in the organization when we want to do campaign we can start with uh, organizing games and then also sports, you bring people together, then it will be easier to, uh, it is like a, 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 a gathering, uh, 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 you, you, you pull, the, the, the gathering puller. People will be attracted to join you for the sake of uh, the games or for the football or for any, any, other, any other type of game. Then after that, then you have the message. You have to make sure you pack up very well the message you want to to transfer then after some time 
you break off, then you, you, you send that message. That's what I was trying to mean in brief. Brilliant. So very innovative. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. So we kind of hear a very innovative. So we were looking from lucky hearing about social media and how we can use social media to share our campaign messages and get attention. Um, I think this is a really nice example of how even with very simple kind of local um, campaigns, we can also raise attention um, using some of these more innovative ways and, you know, speakers, you know, using vehicles, everything that we can do. Um, to raise attention to some of the messages that we need to share on climate. Um, and then we have um, what looks like a llama who has shared the second point, which is about highlighting good plans developed yes. by the community. Yeah, would you like to share more? So we've got Red Cross Climate Centre. Yeah, would anyone who... Yeah, who, yeah, yeah that's that? me. Yes, good good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So I highlighted there some points from different perspective of the development of resiliency in the community. First is the planning, because as we all know, since day one, we've been talking about good planning, good uh, uh, connectivity of the, the LGU to the community. So what good... Uh, one good thing to highlight here is the good planning process of the planning and then the plans that was developed by the community. So it's a good uh, uh, trigger as well to ensure that uh, all barangays or all communities will also develop or encourage everyone to develop their own plans. Second is the tree planting. Uh, since... Um, in the planning, uh, we will highlight nature-based solutions. So we might we might as well want to involve the community in the the tree planting. So while doing or before the tree planting, uh, we can engage uh, volunteers or communities in orienting the community or the whole of the society in the importance of what we are doing. And third is the uh, it's the same with sir the other sir who first explained his uh, thoughts. Uh, the games uh, that we have developed with Red Cross Climate Center, it's all about climate change and ecosystem management and restoration. So it's a good uh, entry point as well uh, We are, when we are talking about the youth or the community as well. So that is my share. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Very, very, um, I think, um, both angles looking at the plans themselves, you know, and then, you know, what they're telling us, what the priorities of communities are, as well as encouraging these nature based solutions, which are really critical for the future of both our biodiversity and our climate adaptation mitigation. Really fantastic short um, thoughts, Patricia, and it'd be fantastic to hear a little bit more about those Red Cross climate center um action um games um, let, let's maybe if you can share a link that would be fantastic to see that 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 those games um okay thank you patricia really great inputs and maybe um anybody else we've got a couple of messages on the chat panel to look at the climate campaign so we've got from paul best practice campaign and we've got from sophie looking at actually what we can bring from this about how people can top up the resilience the importance of topping up your resilience and topping up your batteries as a campaign um, and linking people to the support that they need i, I love that um sophie would you like to share that Oh, I'm actually, I actually find this sort of thing quite hard, so I don't know if the words that I chose were the right ones, but just trying to capture the different elements of sort of three key words, um, uh, you know, sort of growing your resilience or, or building it, and then kind of linking in with other people, like particularly on the community side, but not only, you know, thinking in with sort of the systems that can support or, or, or kind of developing processes that link people together and then allowing you to withstand hazards um, and I kind of had an image of a tree and then kind of like linking with roots but definitely quite unformed I'm not a I'm not a 
um, on social media, really. So there's <laughs> probably a lot better ways of saying it, but that's um, kind of the way that I was seeing it. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you, Sophia. I think that is a really powerful campaign um, waiting to happen and to look at, you know, encouraging people to take care of their own resilience and how they can do that. But also the what we've learned from COVID in terms of the importance of community support for each other. And um, so that could be almost a campaign in terms of supporting each other through the shocks and stresses we face and thinking of other more vulnerable groups um, that you can support. Um, you know, and, and build resilience at community level through that. Um, I, I love that, Sophie. Maybe that's, yeah, I think it's a campaign definitely waiting to happen um, and very much at the personal level, which is, is fantastic. So we've heard campaign ideas from the community level, looking at the, using the evidence we're gathering from the risk assessments, look at the priorities of communities, the climate risks we're facing and the actions that need to be taken. And we've also had heard campaign ideas of how we can kind of campaign for people to take care of their own personal resilience what kind of actions that they can take and how we can support each other um, so I think that gives a really lovely um, spectrum um, I don't know um, Paul you had some ideas there about best practice campaign would you like to share that so uh, Paul, hi hi Paul uh, okay okay uh best practices campaign is uh, the sharing, the sharing of best practices uh, among communities. And I suggest it because uh, within my organization, we are working on what we are calling the new deal for nature, for the new deal for nature and people. And, people here, and within this community and within this program, uh, we are working across Africa and many communities are carrying out uh, a great action and wonderful action climate actions and the best practices come to sharing campaigns come come in the frame in the frame to share all these best practices among communities in africa in africa and and to do so to do so we uh, we are reaching we are we are working with a booklet of best practices and online online climate action campaigns based on what the communities has done so this, this is the content of best practices campaign. Ah, are you Thank ready? you, Paul. Yeah, no, that was really good. And I think when we look at campaigning based on what inspiring actions that are happening already on the ground that need to be scaled up is a fantastic way to inspire people because people often get very overwhelmed with climate change and having a campaign that's based on positive action and best practice <coughs> helps people really see there's hope um, and that they can take action for themselves. So I think that's a really great campaigning strategy. Well done, Paul. Um, and I'm lucky I know um, we'll hopefully share some details of his campaign on the side panel just before we close. Otherwise, um, you can see my in my message up in the chat panel and I'll share it again, my email address. So if you would like to get in touch um, to um, find out more about Lucky's campaign and find about more the resilience batteries. Um, so that's actually a tool that you know we, we actually developed initially to look at well-being and monitoring quality of life, and we've adapted it to monitoring resilience. Um, we're going to be developing some branded guidance um, for um, VSO, um, but I'm also very happy um, to support you to look at how you'd like to apply it to your work. So please feel free to get in touch with me on the resilience batteries. Um, and we can also, if you're interested in the dashboard and how it can support your work, and we're very happy um, to support or Kobo as well. So please get in touch um, for any further information. Um, and just as we get to the end, we've had two hours of intense sharing and skills sharing. I'd like to check in with you all on your, your own resilience batteries at the moment. So let's just imagine we've got one battery which is reflecting our overall energy levels by the end of this session. And I'd like you to look at that, at that battery. Is it empty? How much energy do you have left? How much resilience do you have left after the session? Are you at one? Have, are you very tired and depleted? Or are you maybe at eight or nine? Maybe you feel very inspired. And um, would love to hear from, from each of you. Maybe just give me a number <laughs> on the chat panel and tell me what level is your existing resilience battery? Is it zero or is it 10?
Okay, Patricia, okay. please share, please share. We've got, um, we've got um, Patricia saying six. Um, Sophie, we've got six. Um, maybe share, can you share Patricia why you, your energy levels are at six after two hours? I think that means you're pretty resilient, but maybe you can tell us why you feel you're at six at the moment. Yeah, I'm six. Uh, my energy or my battery is six uh, until now because uh, I'm overwhelmed, but uh, still hopeful that uh, what we are doing will benefit the whole of humanity. So it's a six because uh, the enthusiasm and um, willingness to serve is uh, there. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I think you speak for everyone working in this field. It's very overwhelming. There's so much work to do. And there's so many, um, I guess, solutions that we need to learn and apply. Um, but then we've got each other and um, we've got inspiration um, and the urgency of our action. Um, so I think that's a really good reflection of you know, where you are with your resilience journey. Thank you, Patricia. Um, and Sophie, I think you said six as well. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I think Patricia said it really well. It is um it's in energizing to get into the details of, of solutions and like how to look at it. Um, but it's also, you know, what we need to apply it to is very overwhelming. So um yeah, I found the session um really good, um, but also a lot, so ready for a tea break as well. <laughs> so I kind of went with something in the middle, but really it would be sort of in terms of um inspiration batteries would be higher but also in terms of like sort of personal tiredness batteries would be lower so it av averages out at six i guess yeah i think we all feel that i think we're all ready for a cup of tea um a pat on the back for you know i think we've looked at a huge amount you know from our personal action planning to global resilience building to campaigns so we've covered a huge amount in the last two hours so you definitely all deserve a cup of tea now um and do feel free to you know i know it is overwhelming but we're all here to support each other so please do feel free to reach out and get in touch um just to share also that our partner lucky and vso we're going to be launching a collaborative training um um currently it's going to be designed for our own vso youth volunteers but we're going to hopefully open it out um in the next few months to look at climate risks climate action and climate justice campaigning and having an interactive e-learning approach to do that. So again, if you're interested in taking part in that and doing a little bit more capacity building, um, please do feel free to get in touch. And um, we'd love to be part of that journey with you. Um, and well done to everyone for your energy levels. Keep them high, take some action now, like a cup of tea to recharge your resilience. And yeah, hopefully we can stay in, in contact. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.